As Bryce mentioned, I joined the Treasury back in 84 as a junior analyst, and Bryce was one of the intellectual leaders we all looked up to, really with quite a degree of trepidation, Bryce. And it's quite an unnerving feeling, 30 years later, to have the exact same feeling when I'm reading Bryce's more recent work. But anyway, it's good to be back in Auckland. Um, I studied economics at Auckland University, and I'm, I'm grateful for the role the university played in stimulating my interest in how markets and institutions really work. Windsurfing was pretty good back in those days as well. As a newly minted economist, I moved to Wellington, where I worked for the Treasury and in the private sector, focusing on our economic liberalisation program. And then almost 25 years ago, I flew out from Auckland, bound for Eastern Europe. And I took with, with me the mindset and zeal of a well-doctrinated economic missionary destined to save the former communist world. Well, a couple of years of intended are we morphed into almost complete immersion in the markets, cultures, and politics of some of the most rapidly changing and dynamic emerging markets in the world. I spent 20 years living in Moscow, in Russia, and I spent the last 10 years building businesses across Sub-Saharan Africa. And this has included large-scale enterprises in investment banking, consumer finance, uh, agriculture, forestry, and more recently, urban development. And in the process, I lived through and survived just two of the biggest crises in emerging market history. Foreigners sometimes talk about having a ringside seat in emerging markets. I think my experience was more akin to being involved in the protracted ruck of early stage development and try and imagine the days when rucking was an integral part of the game. Needless to say, those experiences had a greater impact on the would-be missionary than he did on his environment. But tonight, I don't intend to regale you with war stories. Instead, I'd like to highlight two trends that emerged from my business experience that I think are going to be critically important to New Zealand in the coming decade. And both of these are poor, fairly poorly understood. One falls within the opportunities category, and the second is much more of a threat. The first trend is the rise of Africa. The dramatic improvement in the economics, security, and health of Sub-Saharan Africa over the last 15 years, and the even more important improvement in governance and political competition. The important message for New Zealand is that this represents a massive investment in trading opportunity. The second trend relates to the broader impact of the medium-term ascendance of the emerging markets and the decline of the West. And this raises questions regarding competitive challenges, incomes, incomes skills, and public policy responses. The last time I spoke in New Zealand was I was privileged to be giving this Ronald Trotter lecture in 2009 um, on behalf of the New Zealand Business Roundtable. Roger Kerr was the head of the roundtable at the time. Very sadly, neither Roger or Ron are any longer with us. And I'd like to dedicate tonight's address to these two great New Zealanders, two Kiwis who have the courage and, and the vision to dedicate a big chunk of their life to try and make ours a better country. By Africa, I'm referring to Sub-Saharan Africa, which comprises the 45 countries below the Sahara. And I'm going to talk about the dynamic that's already been underway for some time, and then talk about what that might mean for the future potential across the continent. And to help me get my message across, I'd like you all to briefly, and try, briefly try to park a few preconceptions. Because right now, I, I imagine that most of you are convinced that Africa is the hopeless continent. Home to the poorest people in the world, in the region with the most conflict, disease and starvation, and with the most corrupt and autocratic leaders on the planet. And of course, you're partly right. The problem is that conventional wisdom holds that none of this is going to change. Many of you will find it hard to believe, but for the last 15 years, Africa has been one of the fastest growing regions in the world, with the world's most rapidly improving health statistics, school enrollment, governance, and conflict reduction. To get you thinking without bias, I'd like to briefly explore why those negative preconceptions are so strongly held. 
First, the media and the aid industry has been extremely effective at entrenching Africa's hopelessness as the conventional view. All those starving children, famine, wars and despots. No doubt many of you still remember being traumatised by images from the horrific drought in Ethiopia in 1984 which killed more than 600,000 people and wiped 14% of the economy in a single year. The West was bombarded with the images of the distended stomachs and fly blown faces of starving children. The magnitude of the crisis certainly justified the massive international assistance. I've just returned from Ethiopia and the country has again recently experienced its worst drought in a generation which again threatened the food supplies of more than 20 million people. But did the media tell you that this time round the mortality rate hasn't risen at all and that Ethiopia is continuing its trend as being one of the fastest growing economies in the world as it has for the last 15 years? And the reasons for the change? Peace, improved governance, vastly increased agricultural production and better infrastructure within Ethiopia. Negative preconceptions about Africa are further entrenched by the difficulty we all have in thinking about and comprehending structural change. We forget that for the majority of human existence there was little variation in income levels and life expectancy across the major regions of the world. We forget that until the mid-70s it was Asia that was considered the overpopulated, polit politically incompetent, war-ridden basket case beset by ethnic conflict, malnutrition, disease and illiteracy, all complicated by poorly drawn borders. With the exception of Japan, per capita income hovered near a paltry 400 US dollars a year. Many find Africa's complexity disorientated. Moreover, structural change is slow and can be frustrating. But it's the underlying forces for change that will determine the future. So what are those trends and what's driving them? Well, economic growth in Africa has averaged around 6% over the last 15 years. Six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world in the last 10 years have been African, and the same is forecast for the next 10 years. And that resurgence has been broadly uh, based. Growth has accelerated in 27 of Africa's 30 largest economies. And this is benefiting Africa's poorest. According to World Bank data, the proportion of Africans living on less than $1.90 a day has fallen from 56% in 1990 to 35% in 2015, following decades of deterioration. Africa's non-GDP economic in indicators have also improved impressively. From the 1990s to the 2000s, inflation fell by 64%, government debt by 28%, and fiscal deficits by 60%. Africans are better educated than ever before. Literacy rates amongst the young exceed 70% almost everywhere. Primary school enrolment is rapidly approaching the levels of emerging Asia. And the rise in secondary school enrolment has been even faster with an increase of more than 50% from the eight year, in the eight years from 2000. Life expectancy is also increasing dramatically. Since 2000, life expectancy has increased by as much as 42%, and the 15 countries in the world with the greatest percentage of increase in life expectancy have all been African. Annual malarial deaths across Africa have fallen by more than 60% just since 2000, and new HIV infections have fallen by 40% over the same time period. Not surprisingly, the collapse in global commodity prices and the global economic slowdown has had an impact on Africa. GDP growth in the region fell to 3.5% last year, down from 5% in 2014. Other macroeconomic in indicators have also deteriorated. However, the balance of evidence strongly su suggests that Africa's rise is due to structural factors, not commodity prices. First, during the recent commodity boom detailed IMF data suggested that natural resource endowments and geography were not decisive factors in explaining the takeoff of individual countries. Secondly, over the last 20 years, Africa's economic performance has become less sensitive to successively larger commodity shocks 
In contrast with previous commodity shocks, in 2015 per capita incomes rose despite a 31% fall in commodity prices and a massive 71% fall in oil prices, which was the biggest 20-month correction in over 50 years. Finally, and I think crucially, Africa is consistently outperforming its emerging market and developing market peers, excluding China, and that gap has been maintained during the recent commodity downturn. The World Bank forecasts that of the 33 countries in the world that will grow by 5% or more this year, more than half will be African. And looking further ahead, the IMF forecasts that Africa will be the second fastest growing region in the world between 2016 and 2020. So what's driving the sustained improvement in Africa's performance and what do those drivers tell us about Africa's medium term potential? The first driver may surprise you, but is probably most, the most important. Governance and political competition is improving. Incredibly, in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, only one African government was peacefully voted out of power. Nick Cheeseman from Oxford University has recently published an excellent and comprehensive account of the evolution of democracy in Africa. He shows that a quarter of African countries have made significant progress towards establishing stable and accountable multi-party systems. Using somewhat broader definitions than Cheeseman, the United Nations claims that the number of democracies in, in Africa has increased from 3 to 23 between 1989 and 2003. Importantly, the move towards greater democracy has been marked and matched by improvements in standard measures of governance. The World Bank's latest Ease of Doing Business survey indicates that Africa is the fastest growing, fastest reforming region in the world, with five of the ten fastest reformers being African. Rwanda, once synonymous with genocide and poverty, has been the fastest reforming country in the world um, in recent years. And it's great to know that we actually have a Rwandan in the audience tonight. As in Asia in the 60s and 70s, the acceleration of growth in Africa coincided with the reduction in war and conflict. Between 2002 and 2011, Africa's share of violent conflict more than halved. And this frequently had a major impact on economic growth. Post-conflict growth rates in the Democratic Republic of Congo increased by 10 percentage points and in Sierra Leone by a massive 15 percentage points. The reduction in conflict in Africa coincided with the end of the Cold War. This marked a massive reduction in interference by foreign powers in African affairs. As the next chart shows, one measure of this was the sudden fall in aid to Africa with the unpleasant joke at the time being, the Cold War is over and Africa lost. However, Africa's decline only turned around when aid fell once the Cold War ended. Previously, with the West on one side and communist governance on the other, outsiders played a devastating role in supporting some of the most destructive and repugnant tyrants in modern history. Another driver of change is Africa's ability to leapfrog and the adoption of new technologies. Only a tiny fraction of Africans ever had access to a landline telephone. Imagine the impact of mobile penetration increasing from 2% of the population in the year 2000 to 55% in 2015, with 91% penetration forecast for 2020. By 2020, it's expected that more than half of Africans will have access to a smartphone. Mobile telephony has also greatly improved the inclusiveness of the financial system. Africa now leads the world in the adoption of mobile banking. 11% of, of the African population holds mobile banking accounts, approximately twice that of any other region. The number of transactions via mobile devices has more than doubled in the last two years alone. The dilapidated nature of existing infrastructure provides opportunity for technological leapfrogging in other, sometimes unexpected areas. Africa has 16% of the world's population, but only 3% of its generating capacity, and is normally associated with chronic power shortages. 
However, a number of African nations are rapidly building new capacity and have seized the opportunity associated with the falling cost of certain renewable technologies. For example, Kenya now generates two thirds of its power from renewable resources and is a top 10 geothermal producer globally. In the last seven years, the proportion of Kenyans with access to power has more than doubled to 50%. Kenya's also pioneered the fusion of mobile money and new electricity generation. For as little as 45 cents a day paid by their mobile, a Kenyan living in a remote village can buy a solar panel. It's frequently argued that Africa is, is benefiting from a demographic dividend at a time when much of the rest of the world is facing the economic headwinds of aging populations and declining workforces. Africa's population is expected to double to 2.5 billion people by 2050, meaning that one in four people will be African. Approximately 13 million Africans are entering the workforce and Africa will have the largest working age population in the world by 2030. Africa's also urbanizing faster than any other region in history. So what do these drivers tell us about the medium term potential for Africa? In my view, it's very likely that Africa will continue to be one of the fastest growing regions and quite likely the fastest growing region in the world in the coming decades. The virtuous cycle between improved governance and improved economic performance is very likely to continue in most countries in the region. The generally poor state of African infrastructure and the dreadful rankings and corruption in governance are actually further reasons to be positive. Being at the back of the pack simply creates greater scope for catch-up. This is demonstrated by Asia's remarkable renaissance and by what Africa has already achieved. So now that you're all Africa converts, I think we can turn to the opportunities across the continent for New Zealand businesses. Let's start with the most obvious point. The African markets are big and they'll become huge. The fast growing, the opportunities are often very poorly understood and the competitive landscape is weak. In other words, the prize is massive and the competitive barriers to entry are low. The majority of African countries are English speaking and many proudly share our Commonwealth ties. I'm not sure how New Zealand's number eight why mentality is doing these days, but this mindset is extremely helpful in Africa. To generalise just a little, Africans are fed up with carpet bagging, big talking, window shopping foreign investors. They relate well to people who are pragmatic, on the ground doers. For Kiwi businesses, Africa also provides a valuable diversification opportunity. Most of our traditional markets have either low growth or deteriorating demographics. China involves increasing structural and political risk. So the next question is, what are the most interesting industries? In my opinion, agriculture is very near the top of this list. Historically, Africa was a strong agricultural player, and nowhere in the world today is there greater potential for agricultural development. Half of the uncultivated arable land in the world is in Africa. Until recent decades, many African countries had vibrant agricultural sectors and were major exporters of agricultural products. Nigeria was once the world's biggest producer of palm oil, Ghana of cocoa, and Ethiopia and Kenya of coffee. But a thriving agricultural sector depends heavily on strong land title, good infrastructure, and properly functioning financial markets. The conflict and economic chaos that followed independence in Africa was devastating for agriculture. The continent's global share of agricultural exports collapsed from 8% in the 70s to only 2% in 2009. But the negative trends in agriculture have begun rapidly reversing with Africa's greater growth, stability and reduced conflict. Between 2000 and 2013, Africa's output of cereals grew faster than any other region in the world. According to the UN Food and Agricultural Program, Rwanda's farmers produced three times more grain in 2014 than 2000 and seven times more maize. Cereal production in Ethiopia tripled over the same time period. Improved farming techniques, including better fertilised crops, 
and the use of high yielding hybrid seeds have fueled much of this progress. Massive new agricultural sectors have been built, sometimes from scratch. On average, 360 tonnes of fl cut flowers fly out of Nairobi every day bound for the international markets. Since 1998, the Kenyan cut flower industry has increased tenfold. The flower industry has also grown spectacularly in Ethiopia. Despite this progress, in almost all African countries, agriculture is a very, very long way from achieving its potential. Just consider Africa's tiny fertiliser utilisation in comparison with Latin America and Asia. New Zealand's leading human capital and intellectual capital in agriculture could be a game changer in many countries and in many sectors if applied with ingenuity and determination. And to illustrate the potential, I'd like to tell you about one notable Kiwi success story. And this highlights the diversity of the opportunity available for New Zealand ag businesses and also the fact that you don't need to be big to win. Olivado is a vertically integrated producer of avocado oil and sells a range of quality food and cooking oils under its own brand in 35 countries. The business is owned and managed by Kiwi Gary Hannon. 1,500 small farmers supply Olivado with avocados in Kenya and Tanzania, and that number is expected to increase to 4,000 over the next two years. Olivado trains and supports the farmers to improve productivity, and they operate a five-year improvement plan with Plant and Food Research New Zealand and NZA. Olivado now produces 90% of the world's organic fair trade avocado oil and 65% of the total global retail sales of extra virgin oil. Demand in the sector has increased more than 500% over the last five years, and not surprisingly, Olivado has aggressive expansion plans in both Kenya and Ethiopia. Quite a few other Kiwi businesses are making good inroads in a range of sectors, including building supplies. Some of these are supplying Rendeva, the urban development business which I founded and manage. <coughs> Rendeva builds new satellite cities from scratch and controls over 12,000 hectares of urban land. The next chart shows our current portfolio in Ghana, Nigeria, the DRC, Kenya and Zambia. Rendeva buys raw land, typically within 30 kilometres, 35 kilometres of major conurbations, master, and then master plans an entirely new mixed use mixed income development, and we then install all of the requisite bulk infrastructure. We then either sell developed land, or as frequently the case, work with developers to build houses and apartments, light industrial facilities, or commercial real estate. A typical project for Endeavour encompasses 2,500 acres, or 1,000 hectares, and is designed to provide housing for 70,000 residents and facilities for 30,000 daily visitors. This may sound large, but in two of our projects, we're already running out of land. Each development has the potential to create 100,000 permanent jobs and up to 2,000 temp temporary jobs during its 20-year project life. And in each project, we're committing over 250 million US dollars in core infrastructure spend. Our bigger projects also have industrial parks, and these tend to be major catalysts for new industrial investment. The 420-acre Tatu Industrial Park at Tatu City in Nairobi is the largest in East Africa and has attracted well over half a billion US dollars in new light industrial investment. Unilever are building their largest ever manufacturing site in Africa at Tatu, and we've attracted many of the leading East African industrial groups. So what are some of the key lessons and to-dos for Kiwi businesses thinking of heading to Africa. Well, the African markets are challenging and the processes of change are obviously long-term. So you need to be incredibly committed and prepared to stay the course. Desktop research is helpful, as is talking to established Africa players. However, in opaque and rapidly changing emerging markets, hard-earned hard experience is the only way to really learn at the end of the day. And don't dream of dipping your toe in the water, you may not see it again. 
A strong, locally based management team is absolutely critical and this needs to be closely aligned with the core shareholders. You need to bake resilience into all aspects of your business because major shocks are inevitable. Look to try and diversify across markets and, and countries because the biggest risk is actually single country political or macroeconomic risk. And be ready to expand rapidly to fill market vacuums as you gain credibility and experience. So to summarise, the opportunities for New Zealand businesses in Africa are very big, numerous and long term. Not surprisingly, so are the challenges and so is the necessary commitment. The development process behind Africa is mirrored by a corresponding set of challenges here at home. And these essentially arise from global convergence. New Zealand's very poor productivity track record and our relatively weak global linkages amplify these challenges. The key message from my trial lecture in 2009 is that we're living through the age of global convergence. That the rise and ascendance of the West that began with the Industrial Revolution is over. This historic process is now reversing itself as more and more emerging markets adopt the technologies, management practices and some of the institutions that underpin the West's own success. More than 5.5 billion people now live in countries growing faster than the G7. Emerging markets account for 60% of global GDP, up from only 40% as recently as 2000. Recently, some commentators have argued that global convergence is running out of steam because of the issues in countries like Russia and Brazil. Well, I don't buy these arguments for a second. In the long term, the biggest globe drivers for global convergence will be China, India and Africa. In 2030, these regions will be home to 4.6 billion people, or 55% of the world's population. Growth in India this year is forecast at 7.6%, China is set to grow at 6.7%, and I've already said why I think medium term growth in Africa will be high. This sounds more like a tsunami than a slowdown to me. Your empirical analysis shows that global convergence is having a profound imp impact on both the global inequality of incomes and on income equality in the rich countries of the world. The very good news is that for the first time in several hundred years, global, income, global inequality of income is falling, particularly since 2000. A new book by Branko Milanovic provides one of the most comprehensive, comprehensive analyses of changes in global inequality. This maps the dramatic rise of what Milanovic calls the global middle class since the fall of the Berlin Wall and how this growth has accelerated since the global financial crisis. This is one of the things I predicted when I gave the Toronto lecture in 2009. Most of this global middle class is from Asia. Importantly though, even if China is excluded from this analysis, convergence is evident from around 2000. Ludovic's analysis also highlights that the incomes of the rich world's middle and lower middle class have been stagnant for the last 20 years. And from 2008 onwards, that stagnation began extending into the bracket of higher earners in the developed economies. He also quantifies the emergence of what he calls the global plutocracy, the top 1% of global earners. These people have been huge winners from globalization. Based on his analysis, Milanovic poses a very interesting question. Quote, if this wave of globalization is holding back the income growth of the rich world's middle classes, what will, will the result be of the next wave involving ever poorer and more populous countries like Bangladesh, Burma and Ethiopia? Unquote. Indeed, and what about India and the rest of Africa? In the case of New Zealand, detailed analysis suggests there is little evidence of a sustained rise or fall and inequality in the last two decades. In addition, the share of income earned by the top 1% is at the lower end of the OECD rankings. My interpretation of this is that New Zealand doesn't have a top tier of global professionals 
actively involved in globalisation, so doesn't participate in the top 1%. Instead, the emerging markets are constraining income growth right across our income distribution. And this is reflected in our dismal performance with productivity growth and income growth, which I'll discuss shortly. Most rich world voters don't care a hoot that the world is becoming far more equal. Instead, in the West, the squeeze of the middle class and the rise of the top 1% is resulting in enormous polarisation and political friction and increased opposition to free trade. New Zealand's particularly exposed to the competitive threat from global convergence because of our consistently weak productivity growth. But if there's one thing that economists of all political persuasions tend to agree on, it's that productivity growth is the key determinant of future prosperity. In the decade following the Douglas Richardson reforms, per capita income in New Zealand exceeded the OECD average. However, apart from this brief respite, New Zealand has been a perennial underperformer in the global productivity race. This chart from the OECD compares labour productivity growth in advanced economies. The picture is pretty shocking and would be even worse if we added the major emerging markets. Basically, over a period of almost 50 years, we have been one of the global laggards in productivity growth. Moreover, our productivity growth has been steadily declining. New Zealand has performed better in recent years in GDP growth, but to a large measure this is due to high immigration and the significant increase in hours Kiwis have worked both in absolute terms and relative to the OECD average since 2001. Neither of these factors on their own are going to make a sustainable long-term difference to our prosperity. The most recent OECD data on GDP per person employed highlights our ongoing slippage relative to OECD averages. And the picture would be even worse if allowance were made for the extra hours Kiwis are working. In other words, New Zealand's recent GDP performance is masking and deflecting attention from a very deep-seated underlying problem. As the Secretary of the Treasury said, New Zealand suffers from a productivity paradox. New Zealand has immense natural capital, excellent institutions and outstanding indicators for ease of doing business. We also have a fiscal position and debt situation that should be the envy of the Western world. Nevertheless, we continue to suffer from persistently low productivity growth. Given, given existing data, understanding the precise reasons for this are partly a matter of conjecture. However, drawing on the work of the Productivity Commission and other sources, I believe the following points deserve emphasis. First, our poor productivity growth does not appear to be due to low investment in ICT. We are currently at the top of the OECD rankings of investment in ICT as a proportion of total capital formation. Secondly, we do have a very low level of business expenditure on research and development and that shortfall is almost entirely due to our large businesses. Many of our large businesses are foreign-owned, cooperatives or SOEs, and it's generally recognised that cooperatives and SOEs are poor innovators. Thirdly, there is increasing evidence highlighting the importance of international linkages. This includes information networks, participation in large-scale value chains, and linking those connections into local intellectual capital. Small markets tend to limit innovation. As the attached chart from the Productivity Commission shows, our internationally connected businesses are much more likely than other businesses to increase productivity following attempts to innovate than other businesses. And this, this linkage is particularly strong if they have international investments. Regrettably, New Zealand's international connectedness through inwards and outwards foreign direct investment has been stagnating since 1995 in sharp contrast with the global trend. And it's a particular concern that our stock of outwards investment has actually fallen as a percentage of GDP since the early 1990s and is now a fraction of world and OECD averages. Fourthly, in building on the previous point, analysis by the OECD highlights that productivity growth is correlated with increases in the ratio of exports to GDP. Unfortunately, the decline in New Zealand's export to GDP ratio 
is one of the fastest in the developed world. Finally, as also noted by the Secretary of the Treasury, gains in productivity and GDP growth will increasingly depend on knowledge-based capital. Sadly, in internationally benchmarked texts such as TIMS, PEARLS and PISA, New Zealand students are steadily slipping down the international league tables. All of these tests highlight a decline in reading, science and maths since the early 2000s. The most sobering, and I would say frightening, of these are the PISA tests, which are conducted in 65 countries, including 34 OECD countries. Between the 2009 and 2012 tests, New Zealand's rankings dropped from 7th in reading, 7th in science, and 13th in maths, to 13th, 18th, and 23rd, respectively. Moreover, New Zealand's absolute scores all declined, while the OECD averages were stable. And just in case we're hoping there was something wrong with that survey, the, the next survey, due to come out later this year, shows a continued deterioration of our performance. Additionally, in the TIMS 2011 survey, New Zealand's Year 5 students placed 30th internationally, beating only 16 countries. It's particularly concerning that the proportion of students who struggled to basic, answer basic maths questions increased from 15% in 2003 to 23% in 2012. In fact, we have one of the largest gaps in the world between performing and non-performing students. This is partly due to our so-called decile divide, with 35% of students in lower, school, lower decile schools leaving without NCA Level 2, compared with 12% in higher decile schools. A similar degree of underperformance applies to Māori and Pacific <coughs> students. And don't think this is somehow normal. OEC data show that we have one of the widest gaps between the rich and the poor when it comes to reading, and that this hasn't closed despite increasing talk about raising achievement levels for priority learners. From an, from an equity perspective, there are clearly major problems with our education system. Against this background, it's not surprising that in-depth reviews of New Zealand schools, including those undertaken by the New Zealand Initiative, find evidence of systematic failure in identifying excellent performance and dealing with underperformance. Incredibly, 99% of teachers eligible for annual promotion to the next salary band following the formal assessment are promoted. No wonder the OECD has criticised our appraisal processes. So what does all of this mean for New Zealand? When I gave my trotter lecture, I noted that the New Zealand economy was not performing particularly well in the early stages of the era of accelerating global convergence. I concluded that without a change in policy settings and attitudes, we would drop further down the global league tables as fast-growing emerging markets leapfrog us. Scarily, despite our strong institutions and considerable fiscal discipline, New Zealand's economic decline has continued at pace. The balance of evidence suggests two factors that are critically important for prospering in the current era. First, strong global linkages in trade, investment and know-how, and secondly, a highly skilled and highly educated workforce. New Zealand is performing poorly on both of these fronts, and in my opinion, the negative trends are currently set to continue. Our strong institutions and fiscal settings may themselves come under threat. And what concerns me the most that these, is that these factors are reinforcing each other, potentially in a negative and downward spiral. Negative, negligible productivity growth makes it extremely difficult to fund a world-class education system. Weak international linkages reduce our exposure to sophisticated value chains and global know-how, which re reduces the skills and training of our workforce. This in turn undermines the demand for top quality education, which further reduces our international competitiveness. The risk is that this general demise eventually begins to erode our institutions. 2009, I emphasised the risk of a slide in our excellent standing in our corruption rankings. And sadly, this is exactly what has happened. 
I'm also concerned that rising house prices and immigration fuel growth are concealing the iceberg that lies ahead. If the current negative trends continue, the decline is not going to be linear. As weaknesses compound each other, economic and social crises are increasingly likely. We're sleepwalking to an economically ugly place. Before making my suggestions about what to do about these ch challenges, I do want to acknowledge that there is much that New Zealand is doing well, some of which is excellent. For example, in the latest Econo World Economic Forum's ranking of global competitiveness, New Zealand has improved significantly and once again ranks ahead of Australia. New Zealand also ranks very highly in measures of economic freedom. In my view, the key government should also be complimented on its welfare reforms. These have been far-reaching, well thought through, and developed in a way that built consensus. Fiscal performance has been exemplary from a Western perspective. However, the tidal movement of change is such that these improvements are nowhere near enough. In terms of further change, my first and major comment is about leadership. The changes New Zealand needs are fundamental. They require new attitudes. They require the courage to confront deeply entrenched vested interests. They're about economic efficiency, but they're at least as much about social justice. There's nothing fair about our current education system, the gaping holes in our tax base, or the affordability crisis in housing. Efficiency and fairness need to be addressed in tandem. Otherwise, our social divisions will increase and we're eventually, and probably quite soon, going to suffer the kind of irrational political discourse that is now afflicting much of the rest of the Western world. In my view, there are six critically important areas of reform. The first and foremost is a total overhaul of our education system with the goal of being once again a top five performer globally. And this should start with greatly strengthening the link between, between teachers' promotion and pay and their performance. And that's the issue we all have to have the courage to address head on. The goal should be to recruit, train and retain very high quality teachers and highly motivated teachers. The current approach to reform is skirting around that fundamental, fundamental issue. It's too piecemeal, too akin to central planning and too lacking in vision. There should be scope for a much wider range of governance and ownership models, facilitating solutions tailored to the needs of minority groups and disadvantaged children. Much will be learned from enabling competition between alternative approaches and encouraging experimentation. Secondly, there should be a co comprehensive review of the tax treatment of housing and capital gains. A basic principle of fair income taxation and efficient income taxation is that all income should be taxed equally. The taxation of housing and many other assets in New Zealand fails to meet this test. One of the most recent official reviews of the New Zealand taxation system was the McLeod Report in 2001. This noted that the current tax treatment of housing distorts investment decision making and favours richer people over the poor. The form of housing tax was considered but rejected because the authors considered that it would not gain political favour, hardly a robust basis for technical advice. The absence of a generalised capital gains tax creates similar distortions and inequities. Capital gains taxes do raise complex technical issues, but these have been resolved in numerous jurisdictions. Partial solutions like taxing the capital gains of foreign house owners are basically a cop-out that will create new distortions without at all addressing the underlying issue. Thirdly, we need a comprehensive review of the ownership and governance arrangements for the processing and marketing arms of our primary industries. In too many instances, including the dairy industry, the incentives for world-class performance are simply not strong enough. I saw firsthand how Fonterra failed to capture a massive new market opportunity in Russia while well, Nestle and Danon built new multi-business, new multi-billion dollar businesses under their nose. Groupthink, overconfidence and lack of risk taking will be a recipe for our trade and investment to fail in Africa also.
How can their monopolists create high margin innovative products that fully leverage New Zealand's strengths? How can we have strong global linkages if our biggest exporters aren't entrepreneurial? Fourthly, the government sector, including SOEs, requires a further round of performance enhancement to increase efficiency and service quality. The quality and effectiveness of services for lower social economic groups requires massive improvement in a number of areas. All of our SOEs should be sold absent overriding regulatory or competition concerns. Also, based on my experience with many countries' diplomatic and trade missions in developing markets, I believe New Zealand has massive scope for improvement, particularly in new markets. This will be critical to achieving greater global integration. A number of the New Zealand diplomatic posts I've observed at close quarters provide negligible benefits at considerable cost. Moreover, they represent a massive wasted opportunity. In my judgment, major changes is required in the philosophy, dynamism, personnel and accountability. And in the case of Africa, these changes are required urgently while the competitive environment is still relatively weak. Fifthly, urgent steps need to be taken to address New Zealand's housing crisis. International bench benchmarks place most New Zealand cities clearly in the unaffordable category. The situation in Auckland is clearly particularly acute. Quite frankly, this is ridiculous given that less than 1% of the country is built upon. Moreover, the current regulations favour the old and the rich and make it very difficult for people on lower incomes to own their own home. In fact, detailed analysis of relative income poverty statistics suggests that if we do have an issue with poverty, it's almost entirely due to rising housing costs. Research by the New Zealand Initiative highlights the importance of planning reforms to free up the availability of land and to reduce restrictions on density and height. This would go a very long way to clearing up the affordability mess. Finally, we need to safeguard and where possible, possibly enhance and safeguard our existing institutional, fiscal and regulatory steps, uh, strengths. This should include streamlining regulation wherever possible and taking steps to reinforce our strong anti-corruption credentials. In summary, we are living in the age of global convergence. Africa will play an increasingly decisive role in this process and presents New Zealand with very exciting new trade and investment opportunities. However, technological change and globalisation also entail major threats for the West. And given our terrible productivity track record and relative isolation, these threats are particularly acute for New Zealand. Failure to address these threats will have very serious consequences, including almost certainly social and economic crises. The reversal of our long-term decline will require considerable political courage and very broad structural reform. As a Taranaki boy raised in the 60s, I always find it helpful to think in sporting analogies. Excuse me for that. So consider these three questions. First, do we think it would be acceptable for our international sports teams to aim to be 20th in the world or worse? Secondly, do we think our athletes should have coaches and training facilities that are worse than average for their international competitors? And thirdly, do we think our sports teams will be winners on the international stage if they have very limited international competition? Of course not. It would be absurd. So why should our economy and our businesses be any different? 